So I don't know how the priority is. I, I assume, you know, that so it's just funny that where the sidewalks are bad, the way you can do it is to go into the street. Um, which which sort of again, there's this big investment in sidewalks, but they force people to use the streets anyway in places. Um, and so it might be preferable instead of doing a segment on one on Pleasant Street and another segment on King Street and another segment on Bridge Street and another segment on South Street to do get one of those streets. So at least somebody could go the length of some street. And then if they need to fight their way somewhere, they could fight their way out to that and then go on it. As opposed to once you get out there, you still have to go in the street or you still just really can't do it. So why bother? Um, so that was kind of, that was spurred by this thinking about you could have really beautiful paths down there behind Cutchins. And still the only way to get to it would be by driving. If you look at the sidewalks and approach it. Um, and so then I was thinking, well, how could you do this on a limited budget? And that worked me back to the two ideas. One of just maybe find out if there's just some places where you can take a, get a small milling machine to go and grind off the giant hump of asphalt. <laughs> you know, that might be all it would take in some places. Um, and, and in other places, you might actually have to build something. But it, a lot of these places literally are like a four foot section of sidewalk that's mm -hmm. impassable. So rather than thinking in terms of like we're going to do, you know, one section really right, it's not really right unless it's connected to something. Otherwise, there are a series of bridges to nowhere. So that's the first. The second one is very simple. Uh, same thing as I'm sure one you're very aware of. Uh, it's again one of these marginal deals where this winter we didn't have snow, but when we did, <laughs> uh, the plowing was you know there was a lot of plowing done on the bike paths. Um, but just for just a marginal thing. So like East Hampton plowed all the way to the bridge over Route 10. North Hampton plowed all the way to the skate park. And so for, I don't know how far that is, a mile or so, which would take a plow half an hour because you only have to go one direction on it. Um, you could have had a connect, complete connection from you know, East Hampton to North Hampton and, and a lot of people use it already. But instead, again, at the worst time to be riding in mm -hmm. the highway, what you did if you rode your bike between those two cities was you went on Route 10 for that mile at the worst time to use it. it, it you know, I don't know if that's ironic or what, but <laughs> it, it, as, so you have this huge investment in bike paths. You've already made a really large investment in plowing just for just another another little bit. <laughs> the plow's already right there. And instead of turning around, just keep going and then turn around a little bit later. Um, so those would be my two suggestions for sort of trying to look at making a what I think would be a small investment in order to get a larger return on what is already a fairly big investment in terms of building bike paths, plowing bike paths, sort of like we built a lot of sidewalks sure. and, and we have just these, these little interruptions that maybe we're just investing in fixing the interruptions as opposed to perfecting the stretches that are in the thing. Okay, Great. Too. Thank you. Um, any other public comments? Uh, so I'm Benjamin Spencer. I live on uh, Rust Avenue in Northampton. I just had a couple ideas I wanted to float. Um, one of them I've been sort of watching um, how this um, um, Community Preservation Act dollars have been distributed and um, their uh, pickleball courts that received, I believe, $350,000 from CPA money made me think that um, uh, cycling infrastructure could also qualify for CPA money because of recreation um, and even more reasons, transportation, all of that. So it just seems like there is this um, fund available for, um, if it's a matter of purchasing equipment that would help clear the rail trails for those little hard to get places. Um, the DPW, you know, uh, or if it's the parks department or like park cemetery department, some outfit needs this equipment. Um, who would look into applying for and advocating for CPA money um, for that use? Because that would benefit, I think, a very wide and diverse um, group of systems in that family. So that's the first thing. Another thing, um, I'm wondering if there could be like a, a, a scheduled and concerted effort to um, do bike counts. I know that there was a bike count done in 2022, I believe, 
Um, and I think that's something that'd be really important to sort of quantify the usage uh, and really help uh, reinforce and make the case that people are using these paths, people desire these paths. And, um, and when people sort of oftentimes tell me they never see anybody using those paths, a way to respond with uh, numbers um, would be beneficial. And the last part, I sent Carolyn an email to this effect, but I would be... You find gas. Um, I'd be interested in being on this subcommittee, and I would like to apply to be on this subcommittee and at least be, if, if there isn't a space, it looked like there was a space from the uh, agenda, um, if there isn't a space right now, and start that process because it'd be really interesting. Great. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, going to Zoom. Anybody in Zoom? Um, if you could raise your hand if you want to make public comment. We're still in the public comment period. We have other items on the agenda, so we want to make sure we get to those comments as quickly as possible. Okay, I don't see any hands raised. Um, thank you. Uh, so we'll move on to the next agenda item, which let me just peek here. I didn't print it out. Um, is, uh, okay, um, a Valley Bike update. Um, for everyone, I know this committee has been asking about um, what has been happening, and we have been wanting to know as well. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar, Northampton is the lead community for the regional bike share system. And um, we have played that role since the inception in 2018. We're continuing to lead that effort to try to find a replacement operator, their operator um told us they no longer had money to serve, to provide operations to us last year. So um, you all probably know that the system has been dark since actually the fall of 2022. Um, and we were in, intending to restart operations in the spring of 2023. We've just opened bids. Um, we've had three respondents to an RFP that we issued in at the end of December. Um, so we're in the process of evaluating um, those candidate, those respondents. Um, we they sort of range um, from um, very expensive to widely um, different <laughs> cost on the on the lower end. But I think we we still had really three good solid um, responses. We're hoping that we can sign a contract by mid mid March to um, get the um, entity up and running and you know mobilized to evaluate the bikes, figure out how you know what kind of maintenance and um, and repair the bikes that have been in storage now for a year and a half will need. But our hope is that we start the season at the beginning of um, April that we at least start to see some bikes rolling out. Um, mid to late April. So that's the update on that. Yeah, go ahead. Um, thanks for that, Carolyn. Very exciting. To, uh, first about the bid process and then about the uh, the people involved, uh, mm -hmm. um, the staff that have been involved for years. Uh, for the bid process, how does it happen? Are we required to go with the lowest bid as as long as it satisfies the criteria we advertised, or is there are there other criteria that I'm I'm just thinking about no, how do we yeah. how do we optimize the chance that this one will be long term successful? Yeah, so good question. No, we're not obligated to take the lowest bidder because we, it's a it's um a goods and services contract. We we did a separate price and non price proposal. They all have to meet the proposal criteria, but we would just need to justify why we're not taking the lowest bidder, but it's going to be based on, you know, that would be based on non-price. So, and um, I will say that, I mean, there were out of the three respondents, two of them were clearly well qualified. And it was just a matter of, I think the price differences were a matter of um, scale or, um, size of the business, 
Um, so, and then the third operators had lots of experience, but not running such a big system as we have. So we wanted to make sure, so there was a lot, I mean, you, the RFP is available, so you can see what the response requirements were. It's on our website. Um, I think it's still up there, but, um, at any rate, yes, the, that's a long way to answer your question. Well, <laughs> Sorry. And then thanks, Carolyn. And the second question, um, have all the people, all the staff members, all the people who were uh, in the garage maintaining the bikes, who were moving the bikes around, balancing the system, uh, the people who were um, on the on the end of the phone uh, answering questions, who were maintaining the database, they're all gone, and we have to start completely from scratch in hiring. Or is there any corporate memory that we can tap? Um. So there's a is um. Yes and no. <laughs> so in terms of the uh, um, feet on the ground and operations daily balancing, there are still um, both BWEG and hired locally. So there's those folks are still around. Mm -hmm. If the new entity wants to hire, mm -hmm. those folks could apply. Um, so that's one. Two, the the manager of the operations, I um, um, Adam Rutgers, was let go from Bewegan. He has since picked up some other of the uh, Bewegan bike share systems across the country. Um, I've been in contact with him. He's been very helpful, telling me about where things are, what you know, what the. Um, he did not bid on the on the contract, but I had anticipated that he would bid, but he did not. Um, and so that's one piece. The second piece, the back office and the phone um, call system, that the call center, that's not necessary. I wouldn't say that's crucial to have the same people because there are systems in place with bike shares all across the country. And I think um, there, there's expertise in that. Um, the software programming, um, I've been in touch with the software creators. They're based in Portugal. They've been very helpful. They have all the, they backed up our data. They will give it to us. We have to pay for it to get it, to get it out of storage essentially, but we have the resources to pay for it from the performance guarantee that we had said it, that we had been able to mm -hmm. um, call back when B Wigan shut down. Mm -hmm. So um, we have all the data, the database for all the writers, the memberships, um, and and so I feel confident that we um, that relationship is strong and that we can um, lean on them for um, that information. Great. So yeah. Okay. Any other questions on that before we? Yeah. Go ahead. Does Northampton Planning need any help from this subcommittee okay. in that decision making process? Um, not in the decision making process. I think once we so here's the way the decision making process has been is we have been um, we have representatives from each of the um, eight communities in UMass sitting on the review committee. Great. Um, what would be um, helpful, and I'm, I'm assuming you all would love to do this is helping get the word out once yeah. we launch like it's we really want it to be. Um, no, even when it's fine, then we can, yeah, to, to complement your massive advertising budget. Right? It's going to go exactly. okay. Um, so yeah, so great. Send an email blast when, yeah, yeah. Six, when we you have to go. <laughs> yeah, and we'll do a press release with the you know, the announcing yeah. if, of the contract award. Um, the other thing, just uh, on that note, we have applied for, um, uh, first year cost to pay for the city of Northampton to pay um, with the gaming commission funds that we are allowed to tap into. They have added trans uh, bike share as a, as an element for which cities can um, um, seek funding to support. So we may have at least the first year coverage um, uh, by the grant from the gaming commission for our sort of impact. It's an impact fund that they have um, for the communities in the region. Um, is there still a need to find some kind of like generous benefactor? Yes. The system? Yes. We, awesome. yeah. I wish. I, <laughs> Corporate sponsor. I, didn't have to, uh, I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, I mean, that's one of the one of the um, one of the questions we asked the respondents was, you know, what's your experience with finding sponsorship and and creating sort of more of a mm -hmm. um, sustainable funding source for this? Because now the communities will have to pay for operations, which we didn't before. Mm -hmm. So um, it's really important to find those um, dollars anywhere. Those will only last so long. <laughs> yeah because we're footing the bill right right um okay great so um let's move on to the next item here um um picture main street so we're on the cusp of um we're on the um uh, our consultants are submitting the 75 percent design plans this week to MassDOT, um, they, the process, that doesn't mean they're publicly available. MassDOT, um, they're sort of still under MassDOT jurisdiction until MassDOT says that they've received the complete package. So um, that's definitely moving forward. I think maybe later this spring, uh, MassDOT will release those. Um, but it is, um, so we're going to be moving essentially into the next phase of really getting into the detail of um, construction um, process and timelines and things like that. Um, so that's sort of the update on that. We also had to have a MEPA um, review, which you all may have seen the notice posted. Um, we held that in January. That was triggered, the MEPA review was triggered because of the number of trees over 14 inches that were proposed to be removed on Main Street. Mm -hmm. um, and we're in an environmental justice um, uh, neighborhood. So those two things combined triggered the, the filing. So MEPA filing is also happening sort of in parallel with the MassDOT 75% design. So, any questions on that? Sorry, you probably said this, but the timeline where you expect 75% will be uh, released? Later this spring, she said. Yeah, and I, you know, for 25%, MassDOT took a really long time, at least six weeks, um, if not time. more. Yeah. Um, so longer than we thought it was going to be. Uh, so I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? All right. So um, next up. Um, you all, I think we're, um, sort of brought you along about Connecticut River shared use path from, that would connect from Damon Road through the Connecticut River Greenway Park to Hatfield and Elm Court. And so where we were, I think last fall was we were, um, we we're sort of pursuing parallel tracks of getting our 10% design that was finished. Um, VHB was our consultant on that to get us to a, a 10% threshold, which is, um, the point at which MassDOT evaluates and determines whether this could go on the tip and be funded. Um, and so they look at constructability and all of that. In parallel, we were negotiating with the town of Hatfield, as you may remember last spring, that went to town meeting to get support for um, working with Northampton to um, um, create a terminus at um, Elm Court in Hatfield. And so the town uh, members of town meeting voted to support the um, bike path connection, which means we could go all the way through. Um, we've had a lot of conversation with MassDOT. Um, this, the path runs um, in sort of a pinch point um, along the Connecticut River, which has beautiful overlooks over the river as it comes down into Hatfield. Um, but the rail line comes close as well. And so there were, and there are wetlands, so there's steep ravines, there's riverfront, there's um, rail. And um, there are sections of the rail um, closest to the river where um, our design team was um, trying to stay the minimum distance from the rail line. Um, so there's been a lot of back and forth with mass rail, mass dot rail about what they would need for separation. And um, they've been pushing hard to say that they need both a, I think it was a 10 foot fence as well as 25 feet of separation to the edge of the bike path, um, the shared use path, sorry. Um, 
And what that means is it pushes the path into more constrained areas from an environmental standpoint and also from a constructability standpoint, which then, of course, increases the cost. So we've basically been told by MassDOT um, that this is not a fundable project. Mm -hmm. um, so um, they are not going to allow it to move forward. So we um, haven't made any comments to Hatfield yet. We just got the notice from um, last week when I was on vacation. We have got the draft, um, finalized draft MOU from Hatfield with the swapping arrangement of land um, and their agreement of how we would proceed with maintenance and evaluation of the 25% plans. But, and we also received CPA funding to get to the 25% design phase. So um, it's really unfortunate news. Um, what we're trying to think about is, so as part of this whole conversation as well, um, Mass Dot Rail is really alarmed at how many people are coming close to the rail line. They're it's um, they're claiming that as soon as Damon Road gets constructed, the rail speeds will increase, and they're very concerned about people being next to the active rail. And so, I think they are going to be installing a fence, which in some ways will be a good thing because the cost wouldn't be borne mm -hmm. by this project. Um, so it may be that there's some path forward to create some kind of soft surface trail that's not a shared use path that um, because we clearly can't qualify for a shared use path and use mass dot um, tip or tip money to pay for it. So there may be something down down the line. Um, perhaps after the fence is built, maybe we can figure out a way to do some kind of connector, but not a shared use path. So um, let's take committee members yeah. first. Um, the 10 foot fence and the 25 foot separation. How I understand MassDOT has issued their decree, but uh, nationwide, I imagine there's some variation in that. And I wonder, um, maybe not today and maybe not this year, but maybe next year, could that be reopened uh, with MassDOT? And uh, I'm I'm sure that there are plenty of other projects with pinch points that have been able to solve this problem, and I can't imagine that ten and twenty five are absolutely rigid, insurmountable. Um, yeah, because my so again, I I I'm really saddened by this news, and it's a it's a, a, a very unfortunate. However, I had been always been thinking that the ten foot fence would allow more flexibility i can't speak to the constructability part of it but the um but the 25 foot with these kind of rail with trail options and so as we think about mm -hmm. the the soft surface being on the have a, a potential option there is good and also then thinking in, in parallel working on this because i know that between their rail projects figuring out how the rail with trail interfaces with it makes a ton of sense but it's very discouraging. Yeah. Yep. Um, 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 James, do you have a quick comment? Sorry. That's okay. Okay. Um, is it possible to build up to the pinch point and, and then have it stop? And it just, it just keeps, uh, you know, we'll save the connection for. Um, it's years. possible if it's locally funded. Right. So it can't go on the tip. Right. Could, could this was a seven million dollar project starting out. It went up to eleven million when Mass Dot said it was ten or eleven million when Mass Dot said we had to be that twenty five feet off, and then there were cantilevers and bridges across, and that's what brought it up to eleven. Um, our consultants shaved it back down um, by you know showing how we could push you know change the fence material, um, um, do some alternative um, and closer at those closer locations at the pinch point, but it's still six to seven million dollar project. The pinch point is here? Um, yeah, there are a couple. Um, yeah, basically, yes, okay. where the river bends. Yeah, okay. uh, but I guess my question is of that six or seven million dollars, uh, could not, I don't know, five million of it be 
the two ends, but not the pinch point and, and mass dot. Well, I understand that, yeah, but yeah. no, because the tip project has to be a connected, okay. a connected yeah. link. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, is there a way for the public to respond to this um, development and then make it clear to MSDOT that this is something that we're disappointed in? Is there like a feedback option? No. Okay. <laughs> and, um, I just, as an example of a, of a, these trail hard by railroad tracks, the bike to the sea, northern strand starts in Everett, and you could, uh, from the start point, like, you're right next to train tracks. There, this is not, this exists in Everett right now as we speak, so yeah. I don't know why we supply here that don't apply there. That seems bonkers. So. Yeah, so a couple things just to respond. The, I think the other piece of it is that may be sort of a major regional connector, whereas they're looking at this as um, just a stub and not really going anywhere beyond Hatfield. Um, so that may have been, I know they talked about that, that it wasn't like the Mass Central Rail Trail, right? So um, the other piece is that they there was an incident apparently in Rhode Island that they kept referring to where they have a fence at 25 feet and the fence is getting ripped apart by freight flying off the train and they don't know how it's happening and they're scared to death that that's going to happen here and that was at 25 feet so they have this example that they're using um as a safety uh -huh. concern for having Families and kids um, right up next to them. them on the highway. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so at any rate, I think um, I think it does make sense to sort of wait, see what see what happens, and think about alternatives. But I, I, you know, we can't move ahead with a any kind of twenty five percent design. It was not going to be tip funded at this point. So, yeah. <laughs> make one additional point in response to your your point Ben um you can always contact your state rep and put some thanks okay it sounds like it's mass dot rail that is the particular piece of the puzzle this time yes however in conjunction the right so the um so it, it was pretty clear from all the mass dot representatives okay. that they were all on the same train, <laughs> so to speak. Okay. Um, so. so for a future agenda item, not related to this particular project, but the kind of the issues of pedestrian safety crossings that, you know, I know that's been an issue just because we have these places, you know, particularly uh, Damon Road that that have that um um, where there has been ac illegal access that sometimes has gotten people close to the trail. I think we're yeah. in a much better place with the with the tunnel in place, but yeah, right, given right. the speeds, that might be something for us to think about or talk about. Because I know there has been a concerted national effort to try to deal with, you know, just the you know, accidents and things that have happened yeah. with the crossings. Yeah. I will also say just um, in terms of the other folks at MassDOT who were concerned about this project, it's the rail coupled with, they were concerned about the environmental um, impacts along the river with potentially moving that um, trail closer, as well as the connection from Damon Road to the park. That's um, a private driveway now. It's 20 feet wide. We have easement agreement over it. They weren't satisfied that we had enough right mm -hmm. to that connector because they want a full sort of shared, um, not a shared use path, but at least um, um, a shared roadway space. Um, and they were pushing to um, toward requiring that the city um, take that by eminent domain to make it a public street. Um, and so from uh, right, um, sort of at Damon Road that goes, it's the driveway to River Run, but that's road that continues on to the Connecticut River Park. Um, they So that was another complication for them that they felt that it wasn't ripe yet because the city didn't have full control over that and they weren't satisfied with the easement arrangements that we had. Right. 
So what happens to the $535,000 in CPA money that got it for this project? Well, um, we won't move forward on the design. It's up to CPC to determine what to do. And I mean, they would reallocate that likely. I'm not gonna speak for them, mm -hmm. but basically when, when, it, when a project is approved and then it can't move forward, the CBC then make you know evaluates what what to do with those resources. So, um, okay. Any other questions on that? Okay. What's next? I think Donna, you're up. Project updates. Hi. Yep. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Um, so we have, hopefully my audio is working properly. I was working in house problems, but okay, good. So we're going to have a um, busy construction season. I've talked a little bit um, on and off over the past couple of months about what our plans are, but um, we're expecting a very busy construction season with uh, multiple paving projects, including quite a bit of uh, sidewalk work um, that I've talked about from uh, Florence Center all the way down to Little Park. Um, totally reconstructing that sidewalk and then uh, work on North Maple Street and then North Elm Street and um, various other roads around the city. So if anyone wants a complete list of that, um, it's been talked about quite a bit publicly, but I'm um, happy to provide it. Um, just a couple of other things of note. We do have a, a couple of significant sewer projects um, that are going to be getting going shortly. Um, in Ward 3, so a lot of the sewer lines in the city are buried um, so deep that they're not easily accessed and they're over 100 years old. Um, so because the bulk of our system runs on gravity, um, we have things, you know, 10, 15 feet in the ground and it's just not uh, safe or really economically feasible to dig that deep um, sort of start collapsing everything on, on top of the trench like that. Um, so there is a process by which we line sewers. Um, it, and it's really um, it's kind of a new technology, um, but it has been used uh, by many municipalities um, because it's a really cost-effective alternative to just kind of fixing everything in place and you don't have to dig anything up. So it's um, it's it's really sort of um, revolutionizing the way we can fix our utilities. So we've got um, a sewer on William Street um, that's carrying like 75% of the city's flow to the wastewater plant. So this thing never shuts off. You know, it's going like millions of gallons of wastewater a day. Um, and we do have problems with that source, so we are going to be lining it. So basically, we use um, like a UV, like an ultraviolet light, to cure plastic on the inside of the pipe. So it decreases the diameter just a little bit. It makes a nice smooth surface on the inside of the pipe. It resolves any sort of cracks or deficiencies in the pipe, and you get like another 100 years out of it. So the reason I'm talking about the sewer enterprise during a bike and tent meeting mm -hmm. um, is because the work actually is going to be disruptive in that we're not excavating, but we do have to bypass pump. So we have to get all the wastewater um, out of that pipe um, into a bypass uh, so that we can do the work and then put everything back um, the way it needs to be. So we're going to be working on William Street. We're going to be working in multiple locations throughout Ward 3. So the roads are really, really narrow and there's heavy traffic and we are going to have to be um, closing roads and creating detours. So I just want to kind of give everybody a heads up that this is going to be uh, slightly disruptive and our plans will be coming together probably over the next couple of weeks and then we'll be moving on a more public announcement um, just for impacted residents in the William Street area, um, as well as multiple side streets off of uh, Market Street um, and the Bridge Street area. So um, that's where our, um, our efforts uh, are gonna be focused, but there is gonna be some disruption. Um, and Eversource is also doing some gas work in the area at the same time, just a poor coincidence and that's regulatory work. Um, so just for folks who are, you know, traveling in the area, it's just going to get a little bit chaotic. 
um, it, it, the weather warms up. So the, the last thing I have to mention is I did have a meeting with um, two members of the Disability Commission to talk about the state of sidewalks in the city. Um, because I know that the Disability Commission uh, has been doing some work and having some conversation uh, around the state of sidewalks and certainly heard the public comment uh, earlier. So um, I spent some time speaking to them about some of the challenges that we face and, um, you know, why sometimes, uh, you know, we have to make decisions around uh, how we're reconstructing sidewalks or when we put a sidewalk on both sides of the road and even what we'd like to, we simply mathematically do not have the space. Um, so that conversation, um, just as a heads up going on at the Disability Commission, um, we've talked about it at TPC and, you know, I'm happy to engage with anyone who has questions on that, but just wanted to mention that I did spend some time really um, aiming and uh, I'm on the road um, uh, on the Disability Commission. So that's all I get. Thanks, Donna. Yep, Any Follow-up question, Brett. I'm just gonna. Um, so supposedly, uh, I haven't done a lot with this position, but supposedly on the liaison between the bike ped and the TPC. So, or at one time I was. So anyway, I, I'm I'm acting as that. So I go to the meetings when I can. Um, and Don is right. We've talked a lot about it. Uh, they talked a lot. I chimed in. Um, and as regards to complete streets and uh, limited funding um, and strategic thinking around that. And kind of what Donna said was that if we want more sidewalks, we need to advocate with the mayor to fund specifically sidewalks because otherwise it's in the whole roads transportation budget and it, the decisions there I think just get, uh, I'm now extrapolating to my idea, understanding of it, get skewed towards projects where like they're already mobilized in a certain area for a larger road project. So they'll do a sidewalk there and it's hard to do a little sidewalk project elsewhere. That's a good quality up to, up to snuff stuff. So I think if we want more sidewalk work, we're going to have to advocate for specifically a line item from the mayor. That's, that was my understanding. Donna, can you correct me if I misinterpreted that? Yeah, that that's more or less accurate. I, I mean, the capital plan does have a discrete sidewalk line that that is funded on an annual basis, but you know, based on sort of the work to be done and the available money, it's it's uh, it, it's not enough. I mean, for years it was funded at like I want to say like one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and then we moved it to two hundred thousand dollars, and then we recommended it be four hundred thousand dollars. But like everything else, you know, we have a, a, an awful lot of deferred maintenance. So I think this is a larger conversation. I, I certainly think if the mayor could give us the money, um, the mayor would that this may be kind of a larger community conversation. Um, you know, when I go before council for my budgets, um, you know, if there could be advocacy around sidewalks, that would certainly be helpful because those sidewalks are competing with all other things in the general fund um, to be funded. Um, so there is some level of competition for resources and some level of decision making that has to happen about what gets funded and how much and what's reasonable and proper. Um, so I think it is as much of a mayoral decision as it is a council decision. And particularly when I submit my budgets and, you know, I give a, uh, a presentation to the council as one of the largest departments in the city. I give an actual presentation and I sort of go you know, division by division through all of my budgets um, and people have the opportunity to comment on that time. So any, it, at that time, so any advocacy that you could do and, and I'm gearing up to do those presents. I do a whole series of presentations to council. Um, so, you know, any advocacy would certainly be appreciated and that's the time of year. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Donna. Uh, can you remind us please what the timing is for the budget cycle? And uh, when that, uh, when such advocacy might have the most effect? It, sure, I believe that, so in the month of March, um, 
that we typically kind of kick off with utility rates, which is unrelated to this, but, um, and then part of that is the capital plan. So um, it, it kind of, they sort of coincide. So I, I believe that the mayor brings orders to council um, to fund the capital plan sort of in late March. Um, they have a public hearing on the capital plan and it's just, you know, everything in the capital plan is discussed. I mean, DPW initiatives are are, are huge uh, majority of the capital plan. So, you know, we're, we're probably gearing up, you know, this, this next month. I, I would say like probably the second council meeting in March. But I believe that they have to post the announcement of the public hearing for the capital plan, um, like a meeting ahead of time. So at this point, it would probably be the second meeting in March or first meeting in April. And then I typically give a, a budget presentation to council like at the end of April and early May. Um, and then they sort of launch into that budget cycle to vote it by June 30th. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Thanks, James. Um, okay, so I um, can't believe we got through the rest of the agenda <laughs> items. Um, the next one might be the most difficult. Um, I had sent out a message saying that, you know, I think we need to evaluate different times. I know that there's a conflict with this time um, for Nick coming up um, in September. In September. This time also conflicts with the Joint Transportation Committee meeting and the Regional Bike Ped meeting on Wednesday morning. So, um, you know, it's um, it would be beneficial for my schedule if we could change it to a different morning um, or some other um, date or time as well. I'm not wedded to morning, but it sounded like folks liked the mornings. So, um, can we? hear from people about what days and times are good well we we can no <laughs> sorry. we can but my my guess is going to be it, it's going to be more efficient using some schedule and okay when to meet or sure. do all. okay I'm yeah so i'm happy to wait but, but yeah i think it's going to be so i'll send out yeah. then um a request reminder for people to give me the um, dates and times. Maybe I'll throw out some dates and uh, or days and times to yeah. see how many people can. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. You have yeah. So I'll. Um. I think I'll. Um. Don and I will get together and figure out what day works for the two of us, perhaps, and then we'll send out some. So, so I guess one of the questions I would have is: Is a four o'clock time feasible? Uh, given the multiple other things that are going on, maybe we could look at, at that as well as a morning. Um, I mean, that's fine by me. Sure, it just depends on the day. Yeah. yeah. Okay. At four o'clock Thursday's not gonna work at all, but other days could work. Okay, yeah. All right, great. Well, that was easy. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that was easy to punt. Uh, Okay, any other comments before we adjourn? Uh Carolyn, I was I was wondering if uh the signs that we that FNT created to post along the trail, if that's moving forward, if you've spoken to George about that. I know he he sent over the the models that we created. Um I haven't seen a model created. Um oh, so I thought that they were sent to you. I mean, I think at the last meeting we discussed the language and that reminds me, um, I did have minutes, but I don't think I sent them over to everybody. So I have all the minutes caught up and I failed to email those. But I thought that the way we left it was the language was approved. Um, you know, I think we went through detailed um, review yep. of that. Um, but I hadn't, I don't know if I saw a mock-up, but I'll go check my emails and see what happened to that. Maybe it got buried. Yeah, let me know and I'll send them over to you if you if you don't have them. Okay, sure. Okay, thanks. Yep. Great. Anything else? Okay. Thanks everybody thanks. for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, I'm Brett. I'm Howard. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there is a limit, but <laughs> <laughs>